Hello, everyone. Um, I am June Yap from the Singapore Arts Museum. And I want to thank you for joining us today for what is the 11th program for Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories. Uh, this is a project that is a dialogue between the collections of the Singapore Arts Museum, Gallery National Indonesia, Might Young Contemporary Arts Museum, and National Gallery Start the Museum, uh, Museum du Berlin, uh, initiated by the Goethe Institute. Its exhibitions are curated by myself, Anna Katharina Gebers, Grace Sambo, and Griffia Gawi Wang. So today we are very pleased to be able to have with us uh, esteemed speakers um, for this panel titled Entwined Pursuits, Conversations on Pedagogy, Writing Histories of Art and Collections. Here we have um, TK Sabakasi in conversation with Fang Zisu and Shabir Hussein Mustafa. Uh, it's a conversation that really goes to the heart of the Our Brother Project. And we are really looking forward to the insights that will be shared by our generous panelists. So we will um, hear from our panelists for approximately an hour and after which we will move into a Q&A. So in the course of um, the presentation and discussions and conversations with, uh, amongst the panelists, should you have any questions, please just type them into um, the chat uh, and we will um, address them at the end of um, the conversation. So with this, I would like to hand over to Mustafa. Thank you, June, um, and thank you to all the uh, co-curators of Collecting Entanglements uh, for having me uh, over for this session. It's uh, such a pleasure uh, to be here in, in, if I may say, good company. Um, we're going to try and uh, perhaps um, speak anecdotally uh, at times uh, as we go along, but we're also going to get very, very serious <laughs> and, and, and deal with um, deal with aspects uh, that really uh, have driven uh, TK Sabapati's uh, life work uh, over the past uh, five decades. So it's going to be quite a treat and I'm, I myself am looking forward uh, to seeing what, what's, what, what we're going to kind of come up with. Uh, but just to kind of start things off, um, we kind of designed a 60 minute uh, conversation um, really under the title of Entwined Pursuits. And, and so we'll really begin uh, with uh, thinking about place, placemaking, uh, in a sense where it all started, um, and really try and sort of uh, build a, a narrative around uh, what it means uh, to develop a pedagogy. And thereafter, the conversation is going to kind of uh, shift um, into questions around writing uh, and the image uh, itself. Uh, how does one, in fact, approach the image um, uh, 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 Prof. Sabarpati, uh, Fang, and myself have designed uh, a few insights, a few particular images uh, that Prof. Sabarpati has returned to over and over again over the past many decades uh, to really kind of try and break down, right? What does it mean also to return uh, to a particular image across uh, and spread over, over time? Uh, in, in, in that section, we'll also kind of uh, perhaps uh, think through uh, the role of uh, critical figures uh, in the writing uh, of uh, histories of art uh, in Southeast Asia, um, perhaps, you know, touching on uh, figures like uh, Anand Kumar Swami, uh, Latif Mohidin, um, but especially uh, the figure of Reza Piyadasa, uh, with whom uh, Prof shared uh, really uh, quite an incredible um, uh, relationship, uh, friendship, uh, and, and, and camaraderie. And uh, somewhere uh, in this narrative uh, will be the wonderful Michael Sutherland. Uh, but uh, then, so we're going to go into uh, a, a conversation about, about monographs uh, and, and the need for monographs, uh, which will also uh, in, inevitably uh, take us into uh, the terrain of methodologies, right? And and how uh, does one begin? Um, Prof. has 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 reflected on this, uh, addressed this, um, not just uh, through the writing uh, of the modern uh, and the contemporary, uh, but also by thinking of uh, the the great traditions of Southeast Asia, and and in a sense. Um, Perhaps we'll think about this phrase, fieldwork, 
and how uh, field work kind of intersects uh, with the writing, the teaching, uh, and uh, at least in my case, uh, the curating uh, of, of, of art itself. And the conversation really ends on a very uh, special question, uh, which maybe I'll reserve uh, uh, and, and reveal uh, right at the end, uh, but it really kind of pertains to uh, relationships and, 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 and friendship. So um, that's really uh, our terrain uh, that we kind of identified uh, for today. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible terrain uh, that we're going to kind of uh, make our way through. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll hand over uh, 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 proceedings uh, to Frank, uh, who's going to kind of articulate uh, the first uh, question. So Frank, over to you. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, it's a great honor to be here and really appreciate the generous invitation from Singapore Museum and Collecting Entanglement, great team of curators uh, right now in the region and um, in Europe as well. Um, I think our conversation today and our exchange today will also evolve a lot around, I think, Professor Sababati's journey uh, throughout in the past, I think more than 50 years, more than 60 years of journey of developing this very uh, significant intellectual uh, trajectory for all of us. And I think since um, we're kicking off, um, I think this conversation almost um, decade by decade I think, shall we start from um, after uh, your return from London, after your return from London, and you begin to teaching in University of Science uh, Malaysia in 1972. So I, I, I hope our first question, so I'm going to share the slides so we can also have some visual references um, for all of us and also for our audiences to kind of uh, understand um, the kind of uh, visual material and the terrain we are exploring uh, through this um, conversation. So the question start with, um, between this moment after your arrival to Penan and start teaching, and I think the subsequent year, 1973, you joined the advisory board to build out the national collection for Malaysia. So really would love to hear uh, from that kind of inaugural moment of the journey, the triangulation of pedagogy, writing and collection um, kind of depart from these beautiful campuses that is landed in Penan. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, June. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Fangsa for having me and uh, it is a pleasure and uh, in coming to this uh, this moment i wish to additionally convey my appreciation to mustafa and to especially fansa for many many hours of uh, fantastic conversations above conversations uh, and uh, my real humble amazement that you devoted so much of time to assembling materials, prompting memories, and uh, collating manuscripts, images, some of which I had not completely forgotten, but uh, not seen for quite a while. And uh, they have enlivened my, my, my recollections. Um, you say that we might begin in 1972-73 in Penang. Uh, quite rightly, you have recounted uh, a return from, from, from London consisting of a uh, three and a half year affiliation with the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and uh, a year and a half in addition to that of teaching in art colleges in and around London. And, and th th this was the kind of bedrock 
um, from which I I returned initially to, of course, to Singapore, which is which is home to me, and then took up an appointment at the School of Humanities in the University of Science in Penang in 72 and remained in Penang to 1980, having completed three three-year contracts. And that was a maximum that one might be given as a non-Malaysian, as an expatriate. Um, you say that these years, in a way, could also be tracked along certain pathways for the development of uh, art and the writing of art in not only Malaysia, but Southeast Asia. I would like to expand on that to say that these were the years which also shaped my life. It wasn't just my, my professional life, but my, my life in all in all its complexities, in all its difficulties and all the ups and downs that make up life. And it was also a moment which um, brought about intense and thankfully for me, continuous collegiality and friendships. Um, if there has been a single motivation for me to continue with my professional interest in art as a teacher and as a writer and an occasional curator, it has been because of these associations with individuals, um, some of whom have sustained lifelong and others which have been forged subsequently as one move from location to location. I want to keep this in mind and, uh, and there will be occasions to identify individuals as we move along. Um, is there something specific that we might like to home in on in Penang? Uh, if you could, if you could sort of signal one or two in order to sort of give direction to my rambles. I, I'll appreciate that. Uh, could I could I hear on that, uh, Mustafa? Perhaps. Um, yes, um, let's perhaps uh, let's start thinking about how um, University Science Malaysia and the art program um, and the fine arts program mm. um, comes to house um, your efforts. All right. Um, yes, that's that's a convenient point to 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 begin. Um, it there was instituted in the School of Humanities a number of a number of programs. Uh, each culminating in a kind of specialization at the undergraduate level, in, in the sense that a student majored in a particular discipline. And one of the disciplines was the visual arts, which consisted of um, studio studies, principally studio studies. There were four of them, if I can name them very quickly, photography, printmaking, painting and drawing, and three-dimensional, which is sculpture. And then the fifth component was history of art. Students enrolling and wishing to major in fine art um, underwent a, a four-year undergraduate studies. The first year was a general uh, a survey type of uh, um, program. And then from the second year, they were streamlined into, into the specialist streams. Throughout those four years, they were required, in addition to committing themselves to the studio uh, uh, practices, to also taking courses in art history. 
At that moment, I was the only one offering the modules in art history for the entire four years. Subsequently, uh, the, 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 there, were, there were others who joined in, and that came in a little later. Uh, the art history program consisted of a general survey of art and its history's introduction. And then I think I offered a module on aspects of Asian art, which consisted of the grand traditions of Asian art, um, consisting of eight weeks devoted to Hindu Buddhist sculptures in India and Southeast Asia, eight weeks devoted to paintings and pictorial traditions in China and to a minor extent in Japan. And the third, which I offered with great trepidation and anxiety because I knew very little about it, but I felt one had to, one had to take it head on. And that was on Islamic calligraphy. Uh, and we devoted four to five, five, five weeks uh, considering that. Um, I had from time to time assistance from my fellow colleagues from the studio, studio components who came in and, uh, and added, amplified, and uh, widened the scope of the presentations of history into occasionally present and current practices, occasionally. Just to remind myself primarily, and this was my first encounter with the present in relation, in such direct relation to a historically um, cordoned and contoured uh, past of art. And these proceeded for the entire four years. And in the fourth year, a student had to also submit a 12,000 word essay re related to an art history topic. In 1975, the um, department or the section of fine arts decided to introduce a course on modern Malaysian art. And it fell upon me to, to develop and, and, and present that module. And again, as in the case of offering the six lectures on Islamic calligraphy, this was completely unknown terrain for me. I, I, knew, I knew hardly anything. At least I knew hardly anything to provide a ballast, a foundation, a body of knowledge coherently over, oh, I think about 15, eight, 16 weeks weekly two-hour lectures. Mm -hmm. And that, that was an immediate and a deep dive into the modern for me. And the first, the first kind of entry into a world that was alien, that was at that time, very strange to me because my entire schooling in art history, my entire scholarship in art history had been devoted to learning about developing competency, articulacy, both in the delivery orally and the writing of the grand, his art histo grand traditions of art in Asia and particularly Southeast Asia, which is translated into the Hindu Buddhist monumental traditions of Southeast Asia. To leave that, and there was really very little scope for that in the teaching of art history at that time. But there was a great desire, a great need, a great urgent desire and an urgent need to develop some basis, some foundational grounds for looking at, talking about, and dealing with the modern in, in that sense, Malaysia. And so began this mad scramble to get materials suitably kind of presented, 
uh, um, in a weekly manner without fail on schedule. First of all, for students to take a bite at it. And then prior to that, for me to keep ahead of the students, and it was barely that, keeping, keeping about 48 hours ahead of the presentation on that Tuesday morning or Wednesday afternoon, as the case may be. And that forced me, in a way, although I had begun to be prepared for that excursion, for those kinds of visitations to artists, their homes, their studios, their workplaces, their storage capacities, in order to look at their practices, look at their collections of works, look at their collections. They were really not collections, but, but their holdings of textual and written materials, which then were at that time somewhat clumsily put together. I persuaded my colleague teaching photography to come along with me to photograph the works. And I think over about five, four to five years of these field survey journeys, we assembled something like 6,000 photographic images, which we then carefully mounted as slides, labeled each one of them, and began the first cataloging of visual materials uh, uh, that would be available for reproduction and that would be available for study on the part of students and hopefully material for the purposes of research and writing subsequently. Parallel with that, there was an attempt in association with the library at the university to collate and collect written materials, newspaper, newspaper cuttings or reports in the, in the mass media, uh, writings by artists, um, reviews, reports on art in magazines, occasionally in journals. There were no, no magazines or journals devoted specifically to the visual arts, but there was there were two journals in Kuala Lumpur, issued out of Kuala Lumpur, I remember, on literature and culture generally. And from time to time in these journals, that there, were, there was a kind of a monthly or a quarterly exposition on, on an artist, a profile of an artist, a conversation with an artist, um, an exhibition that was regarded by the writer as being important enough to be covered, not just as a review, but as an extended exigencies on, on, on the artist's practice and looking at it historically. There, were, there, were, there, was, there was, I think it was in the weekly Sunday newspaper, in the English language newspaper, a column that was, that was initiated by, and you mentioned him already, who was important, Retsa Piyadasa, on Retsa on art. And a companion column to that was one on theater by Christian Jit, who was just as important in my life and for, for, the, for the writing on art and, and, and other matters related to the visual art. And these columns began to appear without fail 52 weeks a year, I think continuously for four years. They were immensely valuable and they were read avidly. They were read angrily. They were read uh, 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 with heightened emotions by everybody. This is because it was written by someone called Red Sapiadasa. And Red Sapiadasa does not just write ordinarily. We can, if we wish, talk about that uh, additionally later on. And, um, and these, were, these were put together and they formed an important 
informal library for the students, for me as an instructor, and interestingly enough, my studio colleagues who occasionally dipped into these, added their own insights into some of the uh, some of the written documents, and increasingly formally and informally, we began to build what I would call a bibliography. Uh, I, I think these were some of the earliest building blocks that we were involved in. Musa, I think you might want to come in and say a little bit here and uh, and perhaps redirect my 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 narrative in a way that is pertinent to some of the things we wish to talk about. Please, uh, Feng Sir. Yes, um, I will take the opportunity to ask one question because I think specifically uh, you mentioned about your participation and involvement in quite a lot of pedagogical activities. But at the meantime, I think tremendously crucial, you also participate in building off the artist residency program and yourself has been, was writing a lot of articles. Um, here, I'm going to share a few slides. Um, I think what we would like also to hear from you, I think your encounter, take example, right? Your encounter with Latif Muhammadin uh, in the studio, in the program, and subsequently how you start, you know, or you also have a writings about his particular artwork, like those, you know, wall mounted artwork in those occasions. And we also love to hear from you that sense of urgency you indicate in your sharing to articulate something with a, with a sense of uncertainty, articulate something that is actually beyond your training. However, you see the necessity to start documenting it and theorize it. How about we start from you know, your encounter with Latif in the studio, and maybe you can also describe a little bit that particular encounter. Yes, uh, Latif Muhyiddin. Um, I think it was 1975-76, the university instituted an artist residency program, uh, a creative residency program, which was not confined just to visual artists. And the first artist who who was appointed in that program was Latif Mohidin. Um, effectively, it was my first meeting with Latif. I had briefly met him a little, a little earlier in Kuala Lumpur, but that was just in passing. Um, a room was devoted to, was given over to him, and he was in that room. I think six days a week, six, seven, eight, possibly many more hours beyond, beyond, beyond sun, sunset. And he worked on what we could call a series, which subsequently was labeled as the Langkawi series. It was quite a dramatic departure from his practice, which until then was devoted to the framed surface and the production of pictures. Here he was in that, in that work area with bits and pieces of wood, a, saw, a hand saw, paintbrush, sandpaper, and every day sawing, putting things together, gluing things, shaping pieces of wood. And in the first instance, I, I didn't make, it didn't make any sense to me, but gradually these shaped forms began to appear. And these forms were then painstakingly painted very carefully, meticulously, 
all over. Every part of the surface was painted. And some of them were brought, raised into relief. So there was intricate planar surface and three-dimensional structures. I had, of course, in those years, been in and out of the teaching studios. But here was a rare and the first occasion for me to see an artist of great regard at that time already, Latif, in the mid 70s, at work. And he was not at all uh, exclusive in, 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 in the manner in which he was quite, quite open, welcoming, uh, um, perennially with a cigarette in his hand and a cup of coffee beside him, talking, working, working, talking, setting aside little time. Yeah, it, it, was, it was for me a rare and encounter and one which has stayed in my recollection and memory for a long, long time. It was in fact, in a sense, a privilege, but also a rite of passage. And, and it was, it struck me that it is possible to, to begin to think of writing on art and artists by dealing with the material base of art, which often is translated as in formal language. And a formal language that is finished, completed, finitely determined. And in fact, so much of conventional, traditional art history is directed along these lines. Uh, uh, one and, and, and under the rubric of style and stylistic development is to measure and to, to register these singly and connectedly over uh, uh, periods of time in the life of an artist and in the life of many artists in communities of artists. But looking at this, it struck me that there was a social dimension to this as well, because here is a person who is dealing with tools, techniques, uh, methods of making, which he had learned, which he was learning from a resource that was far wider with the extended tradition besides that which he was employing. Mm -hmm. And that had a history of its own. And he, he was learning the conventions and the codes that went along in the making of it and developing his own codes and conventions. So could this, could this not also be an amplified, a widened sector? In the, in the talking about art, in the talking about creative practices. And it has hovered around the edges of my thinking and I, I have by no means explored these myself. And I think, I think these have taken on a certain precipitous positions, especially in contemporary practices in which materiality is so prominent and one may not fabricate materials in the way that Latif does, but the handling of materials, the, and even the excess of materials in the, in the, in the provision of the work of art. I, I, I think it's, there's a whole dimension there that awaits to be, that awaits to be explored. But the first insights into that possibility were viewing Latif. And then of course, this, this provided with me a degree of competence and confidence in talking with and approaching other artists in their, in their studios and their practices. The kinds of writings that I began to develop, and I don't think I'm exceptional in this at all. Many others have done so too took place in, through visits to studios, through conversations with artists. 
It is via the artist and encounters with the artist that I, I, I think that the modern and the writing of the modern, critically, historically, and presently, some glimpses into the theoretical formations of the modern in Southeast Asia was made possible in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s by these kinds of journeys. Without the encounters with artists, such a field, in as much as it exists today, would not have been possible. It would not have, it would not have come about. I don't think I'm the first who's saying this. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 if one looks back and and in thinking of this, I I, I looked at um, if I may just recall um, one of the one of the seminal books on the Asian modern by John Clark called the Asian Modern, published. Uh, um, in 1998. And interestingly, John, and it has struck me ever since I read it at that time too, in his acknowledgement, he en ends his acknowledgement, and I, I, I've written it out here, let me say it. There is no art without artworks and those who make them. And he reiterates this in a different way in his more recent opus, The Asian Modern, which was issued by the National Gallery in 2021, in which it had to do with artists and their artwork, art worlds from Asia compared. So here is the artist. We're not sort of revisiting uh, Giorgio Vasari and, 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 and the lives of the artists, neither are we visiting Chinese art historiography, uh, the classical Chinese art historiography, which consists of largely and is built up largely on writings by artists, but 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 encounters with artists as as the point uh, of generating the initial textual registrations that has remained with me throughout. Uh, uh, I don't I don't presently meet with artists because I think they're for me anyway in my little in my little cubby hole at home that there, 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 there exists sufficient range of textual materials for me to write now on the writings that exist. Yeah. But that that, that 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 didn't appear just overnight, you know, it, it has taken about 70 years, 60 years. And and Fang Se, Throughout my 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 professional commitment, it it has it has come about, mm -hmm. and uh, through intention, through design, and sometimes through happenstance, uh, um, massive trips and blooding one's noses, I was part of that, mm -hmm. and uh, participated in that again with wonderful fellow travelers. Uh, I have already mentioned uh, Piedasa, and then I have named Christian Jit. They, they, are, they are important. There are others whom we will hopefully meet and, and talk about a little later. But this, maybe we can leave, leave this, this matter on that question of the vital central role, role of artists in the writing on art for me and for for others and continuing to be so until today in creating delineating uh, uh, de defining redefining this field of southeast asia as an art historical field in present day circumstances Let me try and um, guide us uh, towards two other related fields. Um, fields that really also emerge um, as this first draft of art history is being authored and in effect 
simultaneously taught in class, which is, of course, the collections uh, that also need to be built. You mentioned library resources, which are so critical, right? Building them um, in Penang, 1970s, mind you. Mm -hmm. It's not Kuala Lumpur. It's not Singapore. It's Penang. That island has a has a special place, I think, uh, to this day. But also the curating that accompanies uh, this this writing of the first draft, right? So um, the monograph uh, that accompanies, you know, uh, Reza Piyadasa's exhibitions, for instance, um, the collections that are built. Uh, at USM, and then thereafter, if I may now fast forward a little bit, the teaching collections that you also build in Singapore, right, which become a tremendous resource. And in a sense, there is a forwards and a backwards because um, you are very much um, a, a kind of participant uh, in the formation of well, what are today the NUS Museum's uh, collections, but at the time, University of Malaya, uh, under the tutelage of Michael Sullivan. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking perhaps there are, there, are, there are two issues here, right? Uh, there is, of course, uh, the, the question of curating uh, that accompanies the writing and the display, because then, I mean, uh, others have made this point uh, as well, that exhibition making in itself Right, is a form of textual production, right? Everything that goes with it. Uh, but I thought perhaps let's start with the collections mm -hmm. uh, because um, the, the collections that are being built are, are, are not just teaching collections. They are also in many ways rec a record right, of what is happening at that moment. Right? So for instance, when you look at the US Museum's collection, the works that Michael Sullivan for instance, acquired in the 1950s, continue to play a very critical role. I mean, that art movement that he chartered goes on to become and find a very critical place within the story of art in Singapore, Malaya, and I think to some extent Malaysia. So that perhaps, shall we talk about this uh, 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 a little bit? And, and, and we've also put together uh, some images uh, from, 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 from the Penang collections, which you brought into 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 um, a kind of a museological frame, uh, if if I may say that, because um, you've told me stories about visiting artist studios and finding all these works, because obviously um, institutional kind of uh, uh, mechanisms, right, museological mechanisms uh, were nascent. No, they were emerging um, and and had not been fully, well, I would say, formed if these things can be fully formed uh, at all. And if they are fully formed, gosh, we should be very worried uh, about that. But yeah. The collection at USM in Penang, uh, that was, I guess, a, a moment, there were a number of enlightened moments in my 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 tenure in Penang uh, and in 73 74 the university coming out of the then 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 they were called vice chancellors now I think they're called presidents from from the vice chancellor's office was to Institute in the university museums, a cluster of museums, not just for the, for the visual arts, for for the sciences, for for theatre. There, there was a there was a course in in performing arts. Uh, there was a archi school of architecture, so a museum for design, and so on and so forth. But let's stay with the visual arts, and and. Uh, Resources by way of collecting storage spaces as well as 
funds for acquiring works of art were set aside, not massively, but sufficient to begin. Uh, and I, I, was, I was asked to be part of the initial committee consisting of four persons to, to set up a, a brief for such a collection and we did, and it was it was to try and acquire works by <laughs> we said artists of interest and prominence. I mean, how else do you say that? Yeah, uh, how, how does one determine these 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 matters? Was part of the part of the engagement, part of the task, um, and. I, I remember there was immense trust deployed to those of us who were nominated to do this. Uh, we had to be our own critical assessors of what we were doing. There was no one else to whom we had to explain anything or be beholden to, which is which is an immense situation, I think. R rarely do you find that today because there are so many gatekeepers, yeah, uh, sort of hovering around and, 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 and wondering why you are doing what you're doing, if at all you should be doing anything at all. Okay, and, and there were one or two possibilities because there was this man called, may I say this, Frank Sullivan, mm -hmm who was a very, one of the most prominent figures in the Malayan, initially Malayan and Malaysian art scene, art worlds, um, in managing public institutions, private institutions, and then a commercial gallery. And he was, I think, winding up his commercial gallery and offering works in his collection. And if it's coming from Frank Sullivan's collection at that time, it was seen as a reputable collection, and and we we had the first shout at that at that collection, and I, I was amazed, and 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 I went along with a colleague of mine to look at this over a longish weekend for three days, and we we looked at the entire collection with Frank, who was there, and he brought all of them out, and we nominated X number of works. In fact, I think we took the heart out of his collection and hived it off to the university. And it was a moment of, for me, it was a moment of, of immense triumph to see these works. I had encountered works by these artists in the National Art Gallery in Kuala Lumpur, which I was already attached to at that time as a member of the board of advisors, and then in the, the acquisitions committee, a few of us were nominated to be part of it. So these were the names, these were the artists who were continually being talked about, presented, exhibited, written on, and they were the, the, the works by these very artists were in this collection. So, and this was my first encounter to actually acquire works on behalf of an institution. I've never acquired a work for anybody for any purpose at all. And that was quite exciting and humbling and a little anxious too, you know, I mean, was, did I have sufficient competence to make these kinds of judgments? It's quite different when you are in an advisory capacity where you are in the company of others and you are you are talking and talking and finally a decision is made and that decision may may have included your advice may not but here you are singly calling the shot man mm -hmm. and wow that, that, that was a, a wow moment and there are, are these works and uh, and i think they have you, you know Fanta and stuff are, the sort of expertise of one one had bandied around these words that somewhat 
distantly as a historian of art, one wasn't quite a connoisseur and connoisseurship was not quite, you know, gel with, with, with art history and so on. But here we are, you know, dealing with taste, dealing with quality, dealing with suitability, adequacy, rightness of collection. Are these not to do with judgment, calls of aesthetic judgments all the time? Till today, these are highly anxious moments for me, and they and and one one hoped that it worked, and I think so far it seems to have. And Patrick Patrick Ng's Ditepi Sungai, which is really I think the full title is Drying Batik by the by the by the by the river, but it doesn't matter. 1965 uh, has since become quite a work of immense stature in, in not only in the appraisal of his practice, but in relation to pictorial representation in the region in Southeast Asia. May I say a few things about this work or is that too, too detailed? Uh, just one, one quick remark. On the extreme right-hand corner, there are two figures to somewhat elongated male figures. They are the only two male figures in this entire representation. The others are all female, involved in, you know, uh, bathing, in, in sort of drying themselves, in beautifying themselves, in displaying their bodies and displaying the apparels of their bodies. But these two figures on the right, one rather dusky and brown, the other with a very pale whitish torso clad in sarong. They are respectively Patrick and Piedasa. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's a self portrait and a portrait. Um, and there is Patrick with, with his with one with a with his right hand in a complicated mudra and left in a kind of a consoling embrace over Pia's shoulder and Pia is leaning, leaning towards him. How did this come about? Uh, Pia had just, Pia Dasa had just completed his teacher's training college and, and, and was awarded his certificate as a teacher. And he was appointed as an art teacher in Victoria School in Kuala Lumpur. And in Victoria School, the principal art teacher was Patrick. So I think this is a kind of a celebration of, of, of Patrick's sense of affiliation with Pierre. I don't know whether Pierre ever realized that he was being painted here. I, I, don't, I don't know, I, that I cannot vouch for. But there is a autobiographical note entered into, which must mean that for Patrick, that relationship must have mattered immensely for him to have inserted inserted such a note in there, um, which adds to the complexity and the, and the historical tone and tenor of the, of the composition. And, and there, there are works of, of intricate, in, intricate uh, uh, histories and historicisms in many of the representations that are there, which I think whose richness and historical patina can now begin to be, to be sort of excavated, if I can use that term, and written on, and thereby their own contextual registers are that much more complicated and connected with other works. I think that that, that should be enough for that, for that the idea of collection and my my reaction to them. I know quickly I haven't quite said anything about curating and curating. Or maybe we'll see, leave that aside for the moment unless you want to bring it up again subsequently. Yes, do you want to continue with that? Yes, please. Fang sir. Thank you, Prof. I think this is a great transition also to think about region since um, Patrick Ong, obvious, was a word with, I think, in the first prize. 
in the Southeast Asia exhibition in Manila, you also mentioned about that particular uh, occasion, right? So thinking about the region, thinking about, you know, different articulation of Southeast Asia um, and I think the encounter of curation, um, which you might share your encounter and, and I think your learning experiences uh, on the another Sullivan, which we're thinking about Michael Sullivan and your encounter with him in the classroom and with that particular establishment of the collection and how does that, you know, uh, beginning, I think what you refer as like a regional um, consciousness start to emerge from that moment and how does that experiences also encounter thinking about curate collection and curate start to inaugurate itself from that encounter back to uh, University of Malaya. And maybe after that, uh, we may also want to talk about the you know, shift. Uh, fast forward, we can also think about in the 90s, all these different moments of encounter, collegiality, and the friendship of major events um, of friends, of fellow um, practitioners in the region in the 90s. Uh, if I hear you correctly, it is the National Singapore Collection. That's correct. Yeah. Um, you must you must rein me in on this, otherwise I will I will take flight and not 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 land anywhere. Of course, it's a collection that in which I began my my studies, but uh what what we are interested in is in the latter in the latter part of its history and this was in the late 80s and 90s um when the decision was made to reassemble the collection which had been temporarily housed in the National Museum uh, because there were no facilities in the newly built campus of the National University of Singapore at Kent Ridge, where it is now largely. And it was only in the 90s that there was a scheme to build a facility called the Cultural Center which would consist of a museum, which would house what initially was inaugurated as the art museum in the then University of Malaya in Singapore in 1954-55. At that time, I had been appointed as a lecturer in art history in the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore. And I was asked if I would help in uh, restoring this collection. And I agreed with great delight. And I thought this would be one way of reconnecting with my own past, so to speak, and to see how it might be brought to life again. Again, uh, this was not a one-person uh, adventure. Initially, I was assisted by a group of enthusiastic students from the Department of Architecture, and we met every Saturday to photograph and catalog the works. And then, was it in 19... When, when was the relaunch of the publication? In, Late 2001. So the 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 momentum was to house it, display it, and along with the along with the rejuvenation of the old collection, there were also new things added to it. And this was brought about with a launch and a publication and a collaboration with three fellow curators, 
Constance Shears, Roxana Brown, and Gauri Krishnan. Of these two, Constance and Roxana Brown were particular historical importance. They were both associated with the then collection much earlier and had worked on various components in that collection. So we were reconvening what it was like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And Gauri Krishnan had just then been appointed in the Asian Civilizations Museum to deal with the Indian collection. And there was an Indian collection component in the collection. So we put these two, all of these together. And in a way, dealing with that material revived and reconnected my earlier scholarship and my earlier studies with the great, what you refer to as a great art historical tradition of Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. And it coincided with a renewed interest in teaching as well. And I was installed in the university uh, as part of the Department of Architecture, Art and Architecture in Southeast Asia of the Hindu Buddhist era. And a colleague of mine, Paina Indok, and I taught that. She did the architecture and I taught the art historical component. Um, the interest in the earlier art and its history began to sort of erupt periodically. And one of the moments in which, which was an occasion for me to not, more, not revisit, but to rethink and reorientate my, my approach to the historiography, the art historiography of the past, was well, strangely, strangely enough with the Asia Pacific Triennial in Queensland, in which I was asked to reflect on Southeast Asia's art historical past. And I think I used that and I took that as an occasion to write on it and revisited a scholar who was with me at that time and who has never left me right throughout in my thinking and writing, and that is Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy. So in a way, I took him on for that in a, in a conversation, in a debate, and his view of India, Indianness, in Southeast Asia. Um, by looking at one single image, which is a magnificent sculpted image, which is a composite of, of Shiva and Vishnu called Harihara, and uh, which, which I thought was ripe for reconsideration in which um yeah this is this is the very one in which uh, kumaraswamy looked at it as a kind of a consolidation synthesis of iconographic and formal properties that are largely derived from india and deposited in there which he admitted uh, with with immense creative brilliance and ingenuity. And then someone like Magdalene Gito in her history, who looked at it completely from the other way, that this is, on the contrary, a, an image that has come about from thinking, resources that had very little to do with India, but everything to do with Cambodia and its neighboring sort of cultural and artistic milieu that, and she said, increasingly India faded 
and the rest of Southeast Asia came into fall. And, and, and I thought these were, this, this was an interesting set of uh, nexus to think about the flows and counterflows in Southeast Asia, not only then, but currently in, in, in terms of looking at the modern in which we are all involved in determining is Southeast Asia merely a kind of a convenient crossroads for people to come here, deposit things and move away? Or are there self-determining sub -determining forces and intentions and ambitions here? And so Harihara <laughs> became not a convenient site and an image for this debate, but personally, it was great satisfaction to relook at an image which I had always been obsessed with throughout my years, and to look at it again was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah, may, may I just say one more thing? You, you flashed an image uh, just before this, and I want to come to that relating with APT, Asia Pacific Triennial. And that was the famous breakfast. <laughs> uh, 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 could, I, could I have a look at that? Uh, uh, yes. Um, I'm extremely fond of this image because in it are, are individuals who matter so much to me in my life. Uh, uh, some two of them are no longer with us, uh, but the but two others are, and 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 they are important. Uh, they have been named Piadasa, myself, Apinan on the left, and then Jim and Eric Torres on the right. And I talked about gatherings of individuals periodically. And it's sometimes it's not the location, but it's these gatherings that matter. And it's it's the it's these these individuals who come together who have the most enduring impact in my life. And I say this not out of sentiment alone. Nothing wrong with sentiment alone, for heaven's sake. But in terms of all that we have been wishing to talk about, it's. I, we talked about artists and, uh, and, and their impact on my writing. I also wish to say with equal emphasis, the, the effect and impact of fellow writers, and here they are, seminal figures, and, and in, in my life too, extremely important persons whom I met at various stages of my life. But once having met them, they have never left my life. They, they, they are there and I, keep, and I keep talking with them and I keep citing them and I keep reading and rereading them continually. Without them, there is no writing for me. No more than without the artist, there is no writing. So Pia has passed on, Eric has passed on. Apinan is very much alive with that as and hello Jim. <laughs> not 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 being modern. Mustafa, yes. <laughs> Bring me back to reality and and the now. Yeah. Um, just to kind of also highlight to those of us who are joining us. Um, I think we'll be happy to share a copy of this this fantastic essay, uh, which you are also describing, which you wrote for the Asia Pacific Trinale, um, which has been republished. Um, yeah, but um, we'll be happy to uh, to share it with you all. Yes. And just to kind of highlight uh, and kind of bring all of this together, because uh, I know we have a couple of questions also. Yes, um, is to say that um, the 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 histories of the modern. As we uh, 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 read and write them today, um, in the Southeast Asian case, I think have a rather complex, and at least for me, a fascinating genealogy, right? And and I think uh, in that 
in that text to uh, just to highlight how 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 complex this whole situation is. Um, you you refer to Marian Rosses, another figure you have uh, read and reread over the years, and 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 Marian's call for a, a, a calibrated terminology. Of course, you know she's 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 really uh, you know uh, fantastic at calling. Uh, for these things, but also Jim's call, you know, uh, where he says uh, he says we must uh, recontextualize modernism in the plural, right? And so, in a sense, a lot of these early calls, right? Things we I, I sometimes feel we 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 too easily take for granted uh, today, but I think in the writing of those early drafts, uh, this 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 all these kind of questions played uh, an important role, and then of course your turn to the great tradition. As another way to look at it through Kumaraswamy, Mapilinjito, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, you have our poor old Harihara, right? Uh, who, who who still stands to this very day, greeting uh, visitors uh, right at the entrance of the National Museum in Cambodia. Um, one of the works that actually gives me goosebumps <laughs> when I visit it. Uh, knowing how many uh, uh, individuals have 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 written about it and 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 thought about it, but I I do you, do you want to uh, respond because there's another there's a question uh, coming up as well. Yeah, just, just yeah, respond. How can I not respond? Just to say that it's interesting for me to hear you say it reference to my citations of these persons. Mm -hmm that you say that some of some of you may take this for granted. There is some comfort in that, that which must mean that there is an acknowledgement that that there is there is a kind of base and foundation textually. But I also think that one should not take it for granted in the sense that that base has to be looked at, re-looked at, reappraised, and talked with and talked to continually um, for it to be in the scope of awareness and conscience. And, and it's in that way that, that a sense of the historical is continually advanced, or if not continually, uh, 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 um, purposefully advanced. I think this is this is this is this is important, and we now have texts that are being collated, put together, anthologized, and these are. There's no more excuse now to say that. Um, that writing is scarce or scant. Not that writing is completed and therefore uh, 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 um, um, self-evident. It's not. So there is there is both some confidence and I think an awareness to continually to relook at it. Yeah, please. The the question that you want to that that one one needs to. I think we have gone on a little bit, and I I warned you. You got to you got to rein me in. But uh, yes, let's let's deal with what the world is saying. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Savaparthi, Moose, and also Wang Tzu for taking us through these uh, amazing images and also the history. Um, really appreciate this rich sharing on the history of uh, what a art historian. I think oftentimes uh, uh, an experience in a, in, in um, well story itself that is not really revealed. Um, and I think it. I, I really appreciate also how this conversation brings to fore um, the passage that is art writing itself. You know, the art writing itself is that kind of journey. And um, I think. Uh, Professor Sapathy, you really talked uh, well, emphasized the importance of the experiential and encounter in this journey, um, but also 
sharing with us the quality of time that is involved in writing out history itself. So this, this, um, all this has been very interesting for us within the project. I mean, when amongst um, the my fellow curators for collecting entanglements and embodied histories, you know, our curiosity really was in the collection. You know, looking at the collections of the museums that uh, we are part of, um, wondering how these works and objects, you know, came to be part of these collections. Um, what under what auspices, you know, and, and also what ways in which we can read them now. So I think having you um, come in and share um, really the experience, right, a very raw experience of building collections, I think is, is really, um, I think, well, it's really important for us and really puts a different, uh, a, maybe a human side, a <laughs> historian side to um, the collection and how it came, um, how it has uh, developed what it is. Um, so we have a couple of questions and I'd like to read them first, but also then expand on them to see uh, how you might, to see if you might have some response to these. So the first question is um, how to create a connected appreciation between education and art literacy. In this context, discussing art collections and historical analysis between museums in different countries. So that's the question, but I'd like to expand upon it further and really connecting it to what you said you've been talking about so far, which um, has to do also with the conviviality and uh, the gatherings, you know, uh, which you had experienced. And um, re I really thank you for sharing really what are intimate images um, from your time with uh, fellow peers and, and colleagues within um, the scene. So perhaps then expanding on this uh, question, you know, looking at how the conversations and, and gatherings went between yourselves, between um, yourself, Pia Dossa, Apinan, you know, John Clark, everyone, um, maybe even describing a typical conversation in these, <laughs> in what, well, from the observation of, of the image is really crossing of cultures, you know, the, what, what the photos you've shown us is really that moment. So maybe if you could share a bit on um, what transpired, and and how you know how how do how do you um, how how did the relationships in a way um, not so much develop, but um, how, how were these conversations on histories on cult on on art itself? Um, how did these conversations go? Oh. A gathering such as the one that I illustrated with that photograph um, subsequent, was subsequently sparked uh, sub-gatherings. Um, let, let me illustrate it with, say, Piedasa. Um, aside from uh, conversations that led to my writing on him, but I think we, we leave that aside. Um, with him, it was fast and furious every day uh, without let up because he practically lived these things during every wakeful hours. And I used to try and remind Pia that there's life outside all these things, you know. Um, mm, this, this led, for example, to providing a monthly written profile of artists of, in, Malaysia, in Malaysia for a journal that was a monthly journal issued by a literary agency in Kuala Lumpur in the late 80s, in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s. It was about 1,500 words, and in that we, we had to provide a profile of an artist, and we took turns to write, and in the writing, we, we sort of um, exchange our manuscripts with one another. He sent me his text and I sent him his text. We edited, re-edited, co-edited things. And these then were published. There were occasions when 
we refused the edits from one another and went our own way and said, too bad. This is not how I want it to be. Whether you like it or not, this is how it's going to be. And uh, and and that that that's 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 how it was. Um, I remember inviting Jim Jim Supankar to inaugurate an exhibition, which I had put together at the then Sculpture Square in Singapore. And we had quite a, I wouldn't say lengthy, but I think two or three communications by telephone and, and writing to develop what he might be dealing with. That was, that was extremely convivial and, uh, and, 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 and formative. Um, with, with, Eric and um, Apinan, these conversations really materialized for me largely in what was published and what was available by way of publications. So the conversations that were social, informal, were then for me transformed and transliterated into the reading of the respective texts that they had written. And I brought to my readings um, voices that were not, vo by, by their respective voices, which I remembered the tones, the tonalities, the anecdotes, which may not be registered in there, which mattered immensely to me. So the, the, these texts came alive in a variety of ways. And, um, and 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 th these kinds of vital vital associations, um, I think, enliven the return to them consistently. So much so, it's habitual now for me that when I write, has 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 Apinan said something about this? Let me go and check. Um, Pierre, of course, he stopped writing in the in the nineties. So since then, there's no re, no no reason. Jim, my 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 thoughts on the Karakan Senibaru continue to be deepened, and his thoughts on them are vital in the shaping of my understanding of the early phases of the contemporary in Indonesia via via Jim's framing of it and his subsequent theorizing, I would say, on the modern and the contemporary. His famous remark is that you cannot understand the, mo the contemporary without knowing the modern. And, and so the multi, the, multi the, pl the plurality of the, of the modern, I think is to me a landmark text and a landmark text that is indelibly associated with Jim Supanka. So it, it's in these ways that that actual encounters continue to be enlivened in my reading of the texts, and and therefore they are not. These are not writings by distant and remote figures. They are they are persons mm -hmm. similarly with John. Uh, uh, they 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 are persons who whose lives crossed mine significantly and continue to remain, even though we do not, we do not encounter and meet one another. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's in that sense, I think, uh, that, that they matter and that they, they continue to, to affect. Mm -hmm my my thinking and 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 really wanting to continue to write largely uh, it's because of what they have said marion's remark still haunts me because i don't think i've come anywhere near her demand mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I said, whenever am I when am I ever going to get to what she asked? And I have to say, not yet. Mm-hmm. I still haven't. I'm not yet. I still haven't. And so there she is, mm-hmm. calling still. <laughs> Married. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds ghoulish, but no, it's 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 important. It's important, and it's it matters. I I hope I have answered some some of the expectations and anticipations of that constellation of questions, June? Yes, very very much so. And I think it it really shows how much more important uh, it is that you are sharing with us these amazing photos. You know, because in a way, it's not just images of yourself with colleagues um, in a time, in a moment in time, but really how these moments extended into writing itself and that the act of writing in the art history um, is an extension of these gatherings, is in fact written by, um, you know, within these kind of conversations, written through the presence of each other. And and I think that that's really a fantastic way to think about art history. That's quite different from, you know, the the convention of art history in books, in libraries, you know, and I think, uh, and I really appreciate that. So I'm gonna um, ask, the second question, um, and it is, uh, it, it looks, well, the question is about um, the concrete steps to create artworks that are, that are in line with the current zeitgeist and could be relevant globally. And I'd like to extend this question then also um, in relation to um, your encounters uh, with artists in studios. You know, so I, I'm reading this question as one coming perhaps from artists asking, you know, what does it mean to create works that are meaningful? And I imagine that in your time with artists, time spent with artists, looking at their works, talking to them about their works, you know, trying to place their works within this larger context, you may have given them some advice too. And advice which might be relevant, as relevant then as it is now, you know, in, in, you know, in, 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 well, looking at their work, but also looking, looking at the relationship, right, that a historian and a curator has. Um, obligations perhaps even to an artist and if you could speak a bit about that you know um, yeah just before uh, prof you respond to that i think perhaps we can also peg the question of curating which um, we didn't fully uh, address right so perhaps the response could be connected yeah um the conversation with artists Mm. It, it, to a large extent, it had to do with shoring up my own ability to write and, uh, and, and talking with them was a way of buttressing my capacity, my competence, and the to say that the urgency with which I wish to want to write can be substantiated. It's, it's not whimsical, or if it is whimsical, it is not only whimsical, but there, there are things to talk about. And uh, and it might be possible that in the course of such conversations, matters were said, uh, uh, things were talked about, which might have come across to either the artist or someone listening to this. Th- there wasn't anybody else who was witnessing these encounters. <laughs> uh, there were, we were we on, on occasions, we recorded, I think we recorded most of these conversations in, in tiny little schools of tapes, which then were transcribed. Um, I, 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 I'm not so sure whether I had given them any advice. If there was any advice, it was the advice of someone who was concerned with conservation, preservation, with the prolongation of the life of things, and which was to suggest uh, gathering their works, gathering information, gathering data of their works, 
this this photograph, for example, of of meeting with, and I, I, I just digress there to give an example of Eng Teng in his in his studio come showcase, which was adjacent one to the other, which was part of his home as well. I mean, th this is not exceptional again. Studios were where one lived and one slept and one ate and one entertained people. And in preparation for the monograph, which is adjacent to it that I, I would write two years later, in, in talking about his life, his practice, the lives of others whose practices affected him and so on and so forth. I, you know, I remember he, he, he sort of slipped out of this room and went to another room and came back with huge rolls under his arm. And I looked at this in utter amazement. And then he unfurled these rolls. And there were, I think, a stack of 40 to 45 paintings in there, oils. I nearly flipped. I, I, I thought I had known Ing Teng as primarily a ceramicist and a sculptor. And there were these pictures. I said, where did they come from? Oh, this was my other life. And there was not just only another life, but an extremely rich, full life. And it has never been seen, not been shown for more than 25 or 30 years. And and it bore all the traces of not being seen and not being shown for 25 to 30 years. Paint was flaking off, it was cracking and so on. Mm -hmm. And I was horrified and I think I raised my voice a little and, and, and told him, oh man, you've got to do something about this, this is not the way to, to treat it. it. It's those kinds of interventions that I think I might have, I might have exercise now and then. Uh, the other would be to, to, to sort of and not insist, but to impress upon artists, uh, uh, especially those who have had a practice of 25, 30 years and more, that perhaps these could be catalogued, recorded, written on by various persons, either of their choice or, or, or through some kind of a consortium of writings and writers. Yeah, um, the, the conversations were convivial, were frank, open. And I, I felt after a while quite comfortable. And I think most artists felt comfortable with me because I was not an artist. I was not a rival. I was not a competitor. I was not someone who was going to steal an idea from the person. If I was going to steal anything, it was the past. Mm -hmm. And then make it the present uh, to the best of my imaginative capacity as a writer and a historian. The, the second matter is to do with the currency, the relevance, the pertinence of works, yeah, of them in the past, of them in the present, and then to mm -hmm. what you described, various kinds of overlapping, coinciding, colliding worlds of art. Uh, this was always a nerve-wracking moment. Um, the, the artists tended to be, on the one hand, terribly coy, and on the other hand, uncontrollably belligerent as to the unquestionable greatness of what of their lives and what they have done. And then, if one were to ask, well, we might like to state that, and then the the kind of modifications begin to step in. And then I realized that it is at this moment, as in the moment of the provision of meaning to works of art, in, in my numerous conversations with artists, it's at that point that they withdraw. They tend to withdraw. It's not that artists do not have opinions as to what their works mean, but they, 
invariably tend to stop there, as if in admission that questions of meaning and significance are for someone else to determine. And then they will come in, or they want to be participants in that transaction, rather than the givers and the generators of that transition. And that was a moment of great revelation to me, and, and, and one that brought about a certain modifying understanding of intentions, you know, our in our our query, our insatiable query as to what did artists intend. I know one tends not to ask this question anymore, but it's 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 no less, no more pertinent to what might what might happen. And I think that's a that's an intrinsic understanding for those who make these things mm -hmm. that the outcome and the impact are not within their call. And that's why there's always that horrendous moment of uncertainty when the artist moves his, her work from the studio to the exhibition hall and what transpires in the exhibition hall is a moment of, <laughs> of knowing and unknowing, I think. That's exciting. That's exciting. How that excitement might be translated into textual exigencies is something which we are all involved in, sometimes with a degree of assuredness, at other times perhaps mistakenly so, but that is the moment of I think real determination and decision. And I don't think that, that that question is just peculiar to the world of art. It impinges upon, it's just that in the world of art, we are incredibly, are we tolerant to multiple perspectives, whereas in the other, works of actual life, we are utterly and increasingly intolerant and wish to be unspeakably authoritarian in the making of decisions and the insistence on adhering to those decisions from a single source. Well, particularly the political source, yeah. Mm. I hope I hope I have talked around that sufficiently with some candor, if not enthusiasm. Yes, thank you very much. So we just have a few minutes left. So um, I also um, I think may, we might need to wrap up soon. But we do have one question here. Uh, I perhaps the answer may not be too lengthy. Uh, which has to do with um, the history of, um, well, your time at USM. Um, a question on what has become of the slide collection and archive made for teaching at USM in the 1970s. That's one part. The second part, uh, who joined you in building the USM collection? So two parts. One is has to do with the where the slide collection and archive, um, the teaching archive is right now. And who was with you in building that, the USM collection? Oh, gosh. It's a specific question. Uh, we could no, also take I, it offline. I've no, I've, no I've, no, I've really no idea what has happened to that archive. I'm, I, 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 when I think about it, there was a time when I used to weep over it and hopefully not thinking the worst. Mm. Uh, but in all honesty, I'm not able to give us, firstly, I'm not able to give a satisfactory answer to myself. And I, I beg the forbearance of the asker of that question. I, I, cannot, I cannot give you a satisfactory answer. Who joined the, at, at the time of the building of the collection? I, I, I remember the chairperson of the committee was the librarian at that time. 
Edward Lim Hakti, a, 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 a fine gentleman who, 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 who adjudicated the proceedings with, with immense grace and graciousness. And the person with, who, with whom I, 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 I who, with whom I looked at the, that component of the Frank Sullivan collection was K.J. Ratnam, who was a professor uh, uh, of, of political science and the dean of the social science school at that time, uh, uh, who was immensely knowledgeable about art and, and aesthetics and mm. was someone whom I had great regard and respect for intellectually and artistically. And then uh, my colleagues in the studio, studio, uh, especially Chu Tengbeng and Li Menghui were involved in various advisory capacities. I think we were, we were the core of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the committee at that time in the, in the mid until the late 70s. I, I, I left Penang in 1980, uh, com having completed, as I said, three three-year terms. Uh, since then, of course, the, the, the university has appointed a full-time director, curator, and, and it's now housed in the former library at the university. And I, I don't really know the condition of that collection. I have not visited it, sadly, for more than 20 years. But I hope, I hope it's not in a sad condition. I hope, I'm sure it's alive and well. Yeah. But is that, is that, is that about it for that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if, if uh, the questioner ever hears of what transpired of that slight collection, please let me know. <laughs> Whatever the outcome is, let me know. I'll be most, most appreciative and grateful. Thank you, Professor Sabapati. Um, so with that, I think uh, that wraps up our time actually for today. And we really want to thank Professor Sabapati for that walk down memory lane, um, for your amazing memory uh, and recollection of uh, individuals, time frames, uh, what transpired conversations even. I think that has really uh, definitely enlivened the history, well, your history for us. Um, I also really want to thank Mustafa and uh, Fangzi for taking the time to think through, you know, how we might even distill from uh, Professor Sabapati's long uh, history, um, some talking points for today, which I think have been very relevant to our project and also I think uh, maybe lead us to even more questions. <laughs> yeah, hopefully more questions, more conversations, more gatherings, and maybe even more history. So more histories written after this. Um, so I also like to thank everyone for joining us uh, today. I'd like to thank uh, our team uh, behind the scenes for helping to put together um, our live stream. Uh, we want to thank Nina, Rangi, um, Naomi, and Chishon, um, and also all of you for attending this session with us. We would like to um, invite you to the final program that we will have for this, for Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories, which is gonna happen in, Ju uh, in June. Yeah, and uh, end of June. And uh, we will share more details of that soon. So thank you, everyone, once again, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.